There is so much to talk about with this Strix Scar 16, includably possibly fake G-Sync support, that we have to get straight into this. I want to start with the performance. This is a pretty beefy machine. This one has an i9 13980HX with 8P cores and 16E cores, 32 gigs of DDR5 4800 RAM, an RTX 4080 laptop GPU, and two terabytes of RAID 0 PCIe Gen 4x4 SSD space. Again, beefy. Performance from the CPU is, as you would expect, pretty top notch. Interestingly, it's actually matched by the 13900HX in the XMG Focus 16 quite well. Technically bested, in fact, despite the Focus 16 not being in its most extreme profile or performance mode. Still, the SCAR 16 offers top of the pack performance here. In Blender, it's the same story, with the SCAR taking a slight lead from the Focus 16, although not by all that much. Interestingly, the 13980HX seems to be considerably less efficient, pumping a whopping 170 watts through itself to get those fairly minor improvements over the Focus 16, or a good 50 watts more, or around 15 watts more once it all stabilizes. Gaming performance, on the other hand, is more mixed. Native 1600p resolution performance isn't too bad, with an average of 172 FPS across these seven games. That isn't bad, although not quite enough to match the refresh rate. Even Starfield, admittedly on low settings, managed to get well over 60 FPS, in fact over 80 FPS, so pretty decent job there. When it comes to comparative figures at 1080p, in Cyberpunk, the SCAR 16 is down at the bottom of the pack. I can't say I understand this result, seeing as the configuration should allow for a lot more performance, but I've tested and retested this, and these are the sorts of figures that I get pretty much every time. Shadow of the Tomb Raider shows a tale of two machines. In performance mode, you get a somewhat sedate machine. It's, it's keeping pace with lower TDP RTX 4060 laptop machines, but that's about it. Kick it into turbo mode though, and well, you get a beast. Almost 10 FPS clear of anything else that I've tested, and that's what I expect to see here. Fortnite is the same thing. Performance mode is fine, but Turbo is actually impressive. Microsoft Flight Simulator didn't respond all that well to Turbo. It does gain 8 FPS on average, which is good, but it still doesn't touch even 4060 based machines. Hitman's built-in benchmark allows me to split out the CPU and GPU performance, and as you can see, the GPU can rip when you let it. Even in performance mode, it bests even an RTX 4090 laptop chip, admittedly a much, much lower TDP variant, and the turbo mode only kicks that up a further notch. Lastly, in Rainbow Six Siege, you get a fairly middling performance, although it's still the best of what I've tested recently. One downside of using the turbo mode is this. Just for a bit of context, this is a fairly normal speaking voice in this room, and uh, I'm about the same distance from the camera as the laptop is, so hopefully you can hear just how loud this thing is. It is painfully loud, like you'll need headphones to use this type of loud. I was talking noticeably louder while you know it was running a game or a test, it is is distractingly loud. Something that I couldn't help but notice while testing was a stuttering that persisted across multiple games, restarts, and even driver versions. I think Shadow of the Tomb Raider's built-in benchmark shows it pretty well. It'll just hang every few seconds. It does this a lot and makes the gaming experience far from ideal. What's even more strange is that I actually think this is the display, because while doing some of the display testing that you'll see in a second, I captured high-speed footage of it happening. This is the Frog Pursuit test from Aperture Grill, and as you can see, the whole image will just stop moving, and then it will really badly overshoot, 
and then it will just carry on. See, most frames don't seem to have any overshoot at all, but then it just stops, overshoots, and then moves on. Yeah, I have no idea what's happening here, but I couldn't go without mentioning it. Now, speaking of the display, that is a 2560 by 1600, 240 hertz mini LED backlit panel that offers up to basically a thousand nits of peak whole screen brightness in SDR. Yeah, seriously, this thing is insane. It is ridiculously like burn your eyeballs type of bright. And of course that mini LED backlight means you get full array local dimming and a functionally infinite contrast ratio. You do have some haloing, in fact it's a pretty obvious amount of haloing even in a bright room, so that's a bit of a turn off for me, I would just switch it back to the one zone setting uh, in the Armoury Crate software rather than multi zone, but I mean, at least you have the option there. Colours wise, this panel is absolutely stunning. To the eye, it's easily one of the most vibrant colour pop displays that I've seen. It's just beautiful. That's reflected in the gamut coverage, which is exactly 100% coverage of the DCI-P3 spectrum. That is frankly incredible, and one of the best results that I've seen. Accuracy seems off with the, the local dimming mode on, but I have a sneaking suspicion that's a bug with the spider X rather than the actual results from the display. Still, disabling the local dimming mode and running the test again reveals a ridiculously good delta E of just 0.83 with a maximum of around 1.6. That's fantastic. What's considerably less impressive is the response types. I spent an awfully long time testing and retesting this to be sure, but I have quite a few revelations to share. First, the response times themselves. The best result that I could get was around 8 milliseconds on average, with the worst results in that test being over 17 milliseconds. That's with the 3 millisecond overdrive feature enabled and local dimming off. With local dimming and overdrive on, the average jumps to 16 milliseconds, which considering this is a 240 hertz panel running at, what, 60 hertz equivalent, is dreadful. Even at around 8 milliseconds, that's only around 120 hertz equivalent, or half the speed it should be changing. Just to show you what's happening here, this is the RGB0 to RGB102 transition, and it's really pretty slow. Even with this tolerance, it's reporting 10 milliseconds there, which is far too slow for a display like this. It's worth noting too that because this is a mini LED backlight, it uses PWM to control all of those mini LEDs, and that means that the actual raw data looks more like this. It's pulsing on and off thousands of times per second. It's only when you add my denoising function to the data that you get usable, readable data out of it. Which I think brings us nicely onto the adaptive sync problem. Let's take a look at another graph. The transition doesn't matter here, what matters is those pulses. They are about 4.2 milliseconds apart, which just so happens to match the 240Hz refresh rate window. Now, this is a G-Sync display, there's even a sticker right on the machine, so you would think that if your game was running at, say, 60fps, you would see those pulses every 16.7 milliseconds, right? Well, Asus doesn't seem to think so. The slowest it seems to run is 8.3 milliseconds, or 120 hertz. It occasionally jumps between 8.3 and 4.2 milliseconds, but it doesn't seem to be able to refresh at anything other than 240 or 120 hertz. But hey, maybe 60 FPS is below the supported refresh rate window. I mean, it shouldn't be, but let's give Asus the benefit of the doubt and say that it is. So let's try this again at 170 FPS. That's right between the 120 hertz and 240 hertz that it seems to be able to switch between and yeah, no. It runs at 4.2 milliseconds here again. Bugger. Also, to be clear, I tested this with both Optimus enabled 
and the NVIDIA DGPU only mode. I confirmed that adaptive sync was enabled in the Windows display settings and when the DGPU was on, I confirmed that G-Sync was enabled in the NVIDIA control panel, both windowed and windowed in full screen modes. So as far as I can tell, this display does not adapt to sync. Yikes. Also, strangely, the input lag was pretty poor too, both in Optimus and DGPU only modes. With just the DGPU, it is a little bit better with an average of about seven milliseconds or so, but that's still almost two frames at 240 hertz. And some of the results are consistently above 10 or even 15 milliseconds, which is really quite poor. It gets worse with Optimus enabled too, running at just shy 15 milliseconds average or three and a half frames worth of latency, with some spiking as high as 25 milliseconds. That's really quite bad. And of course, all of that has a pretty noticeable effect on the gaming experience. Now, I would be lying if I said that it wasn't anything other than fine, but it is noticeably more difficult to hit shots and aim at targets, and of course that stuttering doesn't help either. I mean, it looks incredible, but that's kind of it. The keyboard feels nice for gaming, although I, I do miss the mechanical switches and the XMG Core 16 I reviewed recently, but still this is nice enough for sure. Happily, the Scar 16 seems to have broken the trackpad curse that I've had for the last couple of machines I've tested, as this one works with absolutely no problems. It even has a numpad built in, a rather strange addition I can't see myself using much, but it's there if you want it. IO-wise, that's a little strange too. You've got two USB-A ports, both on the right-hand side, which is kind of annoying, because that's right where your mouse is, and that's it for the right IO too. Everything else can be found on the left-hand side, that being DC in, Ethernet, HDMI, two USB-C ports, and a headphone jack. Inside is kind of where the magic is though. In here you've got two M.2 slots populated with, in my case, Samsung PM9A1 one terabyte drives that are in RAID 0, so make sure you don't remove just one of them at a time or you lose everything. Uh, also uh, two DDR5 SODIMM slots populated with SK Hynix 16 uh, gigabyte one, uh, one rank by eight modules, and below that is the 90 watt hour battery, but above that, is where you'll find the absolutely monstrous cooling package. You get not one, not two, but three fans in here, and the entire width of the laptop at the back is a heatsink, on top of more at both sides. That makes sense since the RTX 4080 laptop GPU in here is the 175 watt variant and seems to sync up to 225 watts at peak. And obviously we know the CPU can dump near on 170 watts into the cooler too, so now you know why this thing is so damn loud. If I'm honest, this machine is a pretty hard one to summarize. For as beautiful as the display is, it has far far too many flaws for it to be a worthwhile purchase. The seemingly lacking G-Sync support, despite the branding, is worrying, and my god those response times were terrible. The performance is somewhat lackluster for the spec. I was honestly expecting chart-topping performance across the board, but generally games were limited by, I assume, the CPU, seeing as when that limit was removed, it did fantastic levels of performance. Still, between the stuttering, the display in general, and the noise, I can't say that this one is for me. While I'm not really in the market for a desktop replacement style machine or anything this sort of thick and heavy anyway, this one has a few too many blemishes to make it worth the three and a half grand you'll need to drop to get one. Considering the XMG Focus 16 is more like two, two and a half grand or so and performed remarkably similarly, I'd get that one instead. Of course, those are my thoughts, but I'd love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think about the Strix Scar 16? Is this somehow still the laptop for you or are you going to go with something else? And let me know what your priorities are for a laptop either like this or just in general as well. If you are interested in it, I will leave a link to it in the description if you do want to check out and maybe, hey, might be cheaper and uh, still probably not worth it, but you know, 
have a look in the description. Also, if you want to be able to test your machine like this, you can pick up one of my open source response time or latency testing tools at osrtt.com. I make them myself and I ship them out around the world. Otherwise, you can hit the subscribe button, check out plenty of other videos on the end cards, and there's a load of other links in the description if you want to support the channel. Often doesn't even cost you extra to use them, but do support me greatly. Otherwise, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it, we'll see you on the next video.